You're listening to Paris Search UK Radio. News, views and reviews from the world of the paranormal from across the UK and beyond. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web. Paris Search UK Radio. The views and opinions expressed by presenters and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Parasearch UK Radio or its affiliates and sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. You're listening to The Spirit Dimension with your host, Kerry Greenaway, right here on Parasurge Radio. Good evening and welcome to The Spirit Dimension. My name is Kerry Greenaway and on a Sunday evening I like to bring you something a little different. Tonight in the studio I'm joined by an amazing person. He is an author, a researcher, he's considered the gold standard of ghost hunting. He has 35 years experience in the field. He's a parapsychologist, he's on the Spontaneous Cases Committee of the SPR He's done copious amounts of articles and magazine um, articles and things like that. He's also done plenty of television work in front of the camera and behind the camera as well. And if that wasn't enough, he also does a weekly podcast called The Ghost Chronicles. I am talking about, of course, the lovely Mr. Steve Parsons. Good evening, Steve. How are you? I'm very well, but I've got to make a couple of corrections. One, I'm not not a parapsychologist, heaven forbid. Oh, okay. Uh, I work with the, the, the strange and elusive creatures, um, but no, I'm not one. I could be, but I'm not. Um, I thought you and, studied. I thought you studied your yeah. for that. Well, I mean, technically I could be, but I just don't want to be. <laughs> All right, okay. <laughs> um, and, and, and it's one of those meaningless words anyway, because there actually isn't um, any reason why anybody can't call themselves a parapsychologist. It used to be quite common uh, with the American investigators up until about 10 years ago that they would refer to what they did as parapsychology or would refer to themselves as parapsychologists. Over here, we tend to recognize that membership of the Parapsychological Association um, and some academic qualification in a field relating to paranormal studies um, entitles you to become a par- or call yourself a parapsychologist. But in reality, it's just a word. Oh, okay. um, the, okay. the second That's the correction is yeah. <laughs> yeah, the second correction is Ghost Chronicles International is a radio show, not a podcast. Oh right, sorry. Apologies. There is a podcast available, but we go out live. I was gonna say I was listening to a podcast earlier of it. Yeah. But it's not just a podcast. It's more it's not than just a, podcast. a podcast. It goes more yeah. it goes live. A bit like this. So we go live and yeah. then it goes to a podcast afterwards. Yeah. But they can catch up with all, all of that, can't they? So if that, they're maddy, if they want to. <laughs> well, being two, gr- so... two grumpy old men moaning about the paranormal. Usually. <laughs> you or do... actually, we were moaning about Donald Trump last week. Right? Oh gosh, you went into politics. <laughs> Nothing is off limits on Ghost Chronicles International. <laughs> Mind you, that could be classed as a whole paranormal subject all by itself, I feel. <laughs> I'm with you on that one. I've just <laughs> hey. found a Lego, I've just found a Lego minifigure hand on my floor. How is weird that... is that? Is it haunted? No, yeah, it's just a purple hand. <laughs> the weird thing is, I can't think of what it's off. Because I've only got the fire hose. One of my boys has been in the office again. They're going to die later. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> I was thinking out loud. So let's talk about the Ghost Chronicles. Because you host that with a gentleman called Ron Kolak, don't you? Is that how you say Yeah, his name? New, Eng- New England's very own Van Helsing, Ronald Kolak. Um... We've been, we've been friends. We've been doing it now since 2012, 
Um, You've been doing it a long time, haven't you? Yeah, it, we're we're like the odd couple um, of the paranormal world. Um, I mean, we have it's a con- it's a fairly conventional show, or at least it started out as a fairly conventional show. You know, you talk about the paranormal, you have a guest on each week, and mm. then gradually we we started to get rid of the guests. Um, <laughs> I just wrap. <laughs> We still do have guests occasionally, but now we just row between, uh, amongst ourselves. Uh, we cover, I mean, there is no topic that isn't up for discussion on Ghost Chronicles International. Um, so have a listen. It's uh, it's on Togginet. Yeah, I did. I had a quick listen to a couple yeah. of them earlier on. It was very interesting. Yeah. Um, so, some of them can be. <laughs> what's the weirdest one you've covered on your show? What's, what's oh, the one that stands out for you where you go, oh, my God, I can't believe someone... Oh, there have been many, many, many um, people who declare themselves to be fairies or half-fairies or um, the product of an alien-human hybrid, uh, people who have uh, claimed to be possessed by demons, to uh, to be... I mean, it, it's, it's, it is a very, very broad-based show, um, and it does attract a very broad range of guests and listeners. You know, there is something there for everybody. Uh, but we do have some very interesting guests. We've had Lloyd Hour back recently. Um, and, you know, all of the big names in the paranormal uh, field that you might expect to be on a radio show. Um, but we also just have, I've got to say this on there, the crazy. <laughs> I just, to, to, actually, my favourite are the American guests. Um, when we get an American guest, because Americans are really good at selling themselves and giving you the hard sell. So you ask one question at the start of the show, and then usually I just turn off my microphone, slide the headphones down, and go and tidy some bookshelves or something because they will just talk them for the rest of the show. They are, and there's always like I've noticed when you talk to the Americans, it's always like their website or something is always oh, yeah. in me, there. Me, me, I, it, me, me, I, I, me, yeah. me. I did this. I've got a book out. They've all got mm-hmm. books out. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, but that, it I makes it very easy. I used to criticise people for that. It does because I get lots of work done while they yeah, while they're talking. Um, mm-hmm. But I used to criticise people because obviously I didn't have any books out, um, and unfortunately you know, now I have. So um, I've got to join that sort of throng of people going, please buy my book. Buy my book. Now, is it two books you've written, Ghostology? Uh, three. Oh, three um, now. Uh-huh. The, first one, the first one was a joint effort with Cal Cooper, which was Paracoustics. Paracoustics, yeah. Um, that was followed a year later by Ghostology, The Art of the Ghost Hunter, which, despite what some people might think, that is not a how-to guide. In fact, it specifically says it's not a how-to guide. Um, how not to go stunt and then the recent one that came out in september this year uh, was commissioned by the society for psychical research and was a reworking a rewriting of their guidance notes for investigators of spontaneous cases which is a posh way of saying ghost hunters Mm -hmm. now that we'll come to that in a bit because that's something that's so brand new out but i want to cover a bit more about your background first before okay. um, we get into that, if that's okay. That's um, fine. I just want to give a shout out to everybody who's in the chat room. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, now we've got the lovely Karen Bezen in the. the yeah, chat you realise they're all missing ice road ice road truckers. Oh my god! Wow. Get up the see. chat room. Go watch. He's, he was trapped on the ice. He'd hit a snowbank, and the front wheel <laughs> of his truck's come off. You better not be watching that whilst you're talking to me, Mister Mister Parsons. I'm just saying. I get it. I might have been. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, concentrate, please, sir. Okay. <laughs> so Karen has asked, what actually brought you into the paranormal in the first place? Because you've been in the field for a long, long time. What was the, the trigger point for you that made you go, I need to look into this? Do you know what? That's a question that a lot of people ask, and I always have difficulty answering because... Oh, Steve. Hello. Oh, I see. Now, he couldn't answer that, could he? He's gone off to watch his ice truckers. Going to have to kill him, I feel. Oh, no. he's back in the house. He is back in. Can you hear me? Now I can hear you, yeah. <laughs> a second. Something, something just went wrong with my microphone. One sec, let me fix that. I love that. The tech guy's having issues with his tech. <laughs> no. <laughs> So what it was, was the cable, as I turned around, the cable pulled out from the headset. 
Well, that's because you're trying to multitask by watching TV and talk to me. I'm not like watching TV. <laughs> you told me not to. <laughs> hey, uh, to return to the question. Yes, go back to the question. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's one of those questions I get asked a lot. And the, the answer used to be, I remember doing a project on religion at school as a teenager and choosing spiritualism because I thought it would annoy the teacher. Um, that I, I was already aware of, of ghosts and hauntings prior to that. I'd been bought um, a Guinness Book of Records one year as a child that had the most haunted house in England, which I went off and read some more about that one. And that, I um, went up to the library and got Harry Price's book out. So I was obviously aware... Um, so they, they would be the two usual points. So it was sort of around starting secondary school uh, with that book, with the Guinness Book of Records for Christmas, and then the um, the school project on religion. Um, but in actual fact, my my parents have reached that age when they start to tell embarrassing stories to anybody that will listen uh, about me as a child. And it turns out that at a much earlier age. Uh, and I have no recollection at age five or six, I used to demand to be taken to places to look for ghosts and would get quite upset if I wasn't allowed to. And <laughs> uh, whilst, while still at primary school, apparently I was doing a Ouija board in the garage with some school friends. Brilliant. Um, I have, Love it. I have no recollection of those incidents whatsoever. Um, so either something horrific happened, I know I raised the memory completely, um, or I just don't remember it, if I'm honest. But it, for me, it happened around around about starting secondary school. Okay. Um, although the interest, yeah, the interest in developing that further, um, probably a little later. So, so the late teen years, when I, I, I guess, like a lot of people, you know, I'd read the books. I'd I'd read all of Harry Price's books, the books by Andrew Green. Um, Elliot O'Donnell and others and decided that I wanted to go and see a ghost for myself and it must be incredibly easy because you just go and sit on the stairs in a haunted house mm -hmm. um, and of course that's not how it works um, Have you ever seen a ghost then? <laughs> that's such an unfair question no, it's because not. yes it is because uh, I've certainly seen things that I can't explain despite expending a great deal of effort trying to explain and understand okay the problem i have is uh with that question is we don't yet know what we can't define a ghost we have no you know we have lots of understanding we think of what the word means and it probably means a different thing for lots of different people uh um you know even the even the oxford english dictionary's version of defining what a ghost is is incorrect because it defines it as the apparition of a dead person which mm -hmm. clearly is wrong because there are apparitions of animals and buses and buildings and aeroplane um so i think yeah i've seen things that i can't explain despite searching hard for an explanation um but whether that's whether that is a ghost then i don't know Okay, so in your 35 years that you've been out in the field and researching, <laughs> experimenting, I have to keep saying that figure, you understand. <laughs> yeah, just remind me how old I am. Because it's, no, it's, it's a huge wealth of experience and knowledge that you've gained in that time. Do you, what's the most frustrating thing this day and age compared to when you started? Because there's been a huge mindset change, hasn't there? Oh, absolutely. Um in some ways, it's 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 like a do it's a double edged sword because way back then um, there was no problems with accessing locations in order to spend a long time there. You know, the, one of the cases we we visited uh, weekly or several times a week for over three years in order to try to pin down uh, some understanding of what was taking place. But now the cases are much fewer and far between and uh, finding cases that haven't been trampled to death by the local ghost hunters uh, in their desire for five minutes of glory in the daily mirror is very much more difficult um, also the the awareness of the public and the perception of the public um, 
when they call you in has changed nowadays because of the television programs and because very much more than even than the television program social media uh, they have an awareness and an expectation of what they expect from you as the investigator when you when you turn up and if you don't meet that expectation um, often they can be quite disappointed if you don't turn up with you know five truckloads of equipment and a camera crew or or a haunted doll or or uh, salt or whatever their expectations are um, so the it, it's changed dramatically and quite remarkably since 2000. And that's, that's, I mean, obviously television plays its part, but much more um, now is social media. Mm-hmm. And that's directly affecting both the way people are investigating cases because mm-hmm. uh, they, they're using social media to communicate methods and ideas and uh, equipment and techniques with each other. Um, there is also when we when we started investigating all those years ago, the internet didn't exist, mm. um, and what was cool was we didn't have to answer to anybody except the person whose property we were investigating, and so we could spend as long as we liked working on um, trying to solve the conundrums that we were uh, we and the owners of the property were being presented with without any sort of pressure to do anything or say anything. But now the groups feel obliged to, they've got to be on Facebook Live. They have to put their results on the next morning onto social media or, or their YouTube channel. They have to continually tweet and update their statuses as they're investigating. So the pressure on, on investigators now has switched from getting the job done to getting the job done whilst also maintaining their, their you know, growing uh, social media presence and you know dealing with their fans and supporters. Uh, do you think that has actually created a um, drop in standards in investigations? Oh, inevitably, inevitably, and you do see that because people are much more focused on instantaneous results, and that's why we see the growth in the instantaneous uh, types of experiment that they've done. Um, it's almost you know the 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 use of electronic voice phenomena, because if you play a recording, you will get something back and there will be almost inevitably be somebody who will interpret that paranormally, especially if you front load um, the situation of, with expectation and belief. You know, tell me your name. <laughs> oh, it's a it's Simon. Um, <laughs> I mean, re- realistically, electronic voice phenomena, um, in terms of the way it is done today with handheld digital recorders, played mm-hmm. back and reviewed, um, I mean, it's like crack cocaine to ghost hunters. It's never going to fail. Um, and will, you know, if you've got a room of skeptics, you can spook them out with an EVP device. Um, and you don't, you never saw those sort of pieces of equipment. We would spend, um, and there are still groups that do it that way, um, you know, a long time laboriously measuring small temperature changes or laboriously plotting object movements over out many hours, days, weeks um, to see if anything would take place. Uh, meticulously documenting, you know, uh, pages and pages and pages of uh, the, the witness experiences, trying to see if there's a pattern emerging uh, in, in the, the nature of the experiences, we didn't have to, you know, produce a Class A EVP or tweet every five minutes, or, or and so with that added distraction, there is an inevitability that the standard will drop, um, and also groups are, uh, are uh, they're seeing their heroes, and Zach is one of them. Zach Bacon is one of them. Um, Exactly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, and, hashtag yeah, demon. <laughs> yeah, and you, dude, and you you do see that trickle down effect. You do see more groups starting to emulate their television heroes. Now, you know it's easy to it's easy to pour scorn and to laugh at the groups, but we've had the situation since the millennia um, 
where groups have been largely abandoned by the academics. The academics have moved, they've sort of walled themselves into their ivory towers. And there's been no outreach from organisations um, like, for example, uh, the Society for Psychical Research uh, uh, or the mainstream academic departments um, that, that have parapsychology or anomalous psychology. Uh, they've, they've pretty much cast the ghost hunters adrift. And so without resources their only resource then is to turn to one another for support to turn to one another for ideas to uh for peer review well what does this mean i've got this result what do you guys has anybody else got similar um and so you end up with an inevitable i can say dumbing down um of the evidence now we've got 900 plus paranormal groups in the UK at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, now, that's an awful lot of people expending an awful lot of effort. And an awful lot of those people are in a perfect position uh, to obtain useful, valuable uh, information that we can pass up to uh, the, the scientists, the academics, the skeptics and the critics. And challenge them to come and take a better look. But as long as our get, uh, uh, until we up our game, until go, uh, the amateurs up up their game, we can never be taken seriously. While we're running around with dolls, teddy bears, dealy boppers, and all manner of kids' toys stuffed with flashing lights, because that's not credible. That, there's no credible um, evidence there. You're not providing information. Oh well, yeah. So so what? So the ghost lit up three lights on your your cat you know on your teddy bear that's that's not science that's just three lights on a teddy bear that's anecdotal it might convince you but it's never going to convince a scientist mm -hmm. and in areas where uh, like astronomy or astrology and uh, astronomy and archaeology um, the amateurs have learned to work very closely with uh, their academic peers and produce credible works and challenge the the uh, academics mm -hmm. to rethink their own ideas in terms of what the the discoveries that are being made are um now that isn't happening yet in ghost hunting it was starting to happen in the 1990s uh but now we've hit this sort of um downturn downtrend and I've been saying for years, if, if the amateurs up their game and make their produce credible results from their investigations and challenge the, and I don't mean challenge them by saying, hey, listen to my e my class A EVP. Uh, I mean with proper, meaningful, well uh, well gathered uh, evidence and information, then we we can alter it. I, I agree, but I think there's a responsibility from both sides. I think. The, oh, absolutely. It, it, it's going to take both sides to want to work together. So, from the ghost hunting community that's out there doing their doing their thing, to want to learn and educate themselves further, and from the academics to go, okay, let let's approach some my local team or or whatever and see if we can can work together in in doing that. So, I think it's a two way thing. I think it's a. I a, absolutely. I absolutely agree. And I've been berating uh, the ASAP and the SPR about this for the last two or three years um, at their conferences, telling them that they, you know, that they lack outreach. In fact, now we're in a weird, in, in, in the weird and sad situation where at quite a lot of times when I meet investigators, they haven't heard of the Society for Psychical Research. Yeah. Or they haven't heard of the Association for the Scientific Study of Anomalous Phenomena. Or if they have, they don't know what they do. Um, you know, they oh well, the SPR weren't they that group that that messed up at Enfield and had to be saved by the Warrens, or uh, <laughs> because the, these 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 groups have become much more academic, uh, much more um, inward looking, and, f and lack any form of outreach. And that's one of the things that uh, is starting to change because they've been. Uh, harassed and harangued about it for the last two or three years okay. and in fact that's what that's what the new guidance notes are about and there's younger blood coming through as well um 
Yes. <laughs> to... <laughs> I don't mean to be that rude. I don't, I'm not being um, rude about anybody. <laughs> uh, uh, well, there are. I mean, yeah, there, are, there will inevitably be uh, a t- turnover of membership. I mean, within the SPR, unfortunately, recently, we've had some of the, the great names of uh, paranormal research. Guy Lyon Playfer, the investigator mm-hmm. from Anfield, mm-hmm. uh, Tony Cornell, and Maurice Gross, another of the Anfield investigators, have all passed on. Um, you know, life life goes on, and they haven't got back to us yet to tell us that it's okay on the other side. But uh, their work so remains. You, uh, their body of work their, does remain, and that's the important thing, isn't it? It is, but what's even more important is that the modern generation of investigators realise that that body of work exists, and it could save them. You know, there is a huge and vast resource. Of, there's a whole 150 years of psychical research. Uh, where many of the things that the modern investigators are confronting and looking at have been examined and have been tested and have been found either wanting or to be areas where uh, you know, more research is needed. Mm-hmm. But we encountered a situation uh, quite recently um, when the guidance notes came out. One of the comments um, was, well, who the hell do the SPR think they are? Just because they've been around 135 years, they don't have to tell me how to do a ghost investigation. That The arrogance of that comment, um, first of all, is quite breathtaking, but shows a good example of how self-confident and overconfident uh, many investigators are. They, the belief that we can't learn anything new or experience trumps everything else. It's, it's very self-illusionary. It, it's rather like this idea of uh, if you ask somebody how good a driver they are, they're always really good and everybody else is really rubbish. You know, we, we should never stop learning and developing and going back and looking at what's happened before and using the resources that are available. Um, lest we just keep repeating the same mistakes over and over. I mean, at the moment, there's a huge fight over orbs again which was done to death in 2002 and three. Yeah. Um, but now we've got a whole new generation of investigators who are all fighting over the orbs again. Yeah. <laughs> you know. I was going to ask you about this, actually, because there's a, an argument that most people accept now in the field that uh, 99% of orbs are explainable, <laughs> but there is that 1% that isn't. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm on the, I'm, I have to say, I'm not on the fence on this. As far as I'm concerned, orbs are not paranormal activity what's your take because i know you did some interesting experimentation on orbs didn't you well this is going back over the, 10 years yeah the dual lens um, camera you did some experimentation that's right. on didn't you we used a stereo camera because there was one way of definitively showing that the orb was very close to the camera where it should be if the orb zone theory was correct and we could i think at the end of the day more than twenty thousand sets of images were ultimately taken uh, before the camera finally died. Uh, and, yeah, I mean, 100% of ours were explainable. We never saw an anomalous photograph um, of an orb. It would have been cool if we got a 3D ghost, but it's also <laughs> that, that that statistic that you bandy around, 99% of all orbs are dust and moisture and insects, but 1% are paranormal. What people usually mean is it's the 1% that they've got. That yeah. Their picture is... And special and everybody else's it can be debunked but theirs is doing something weird or special or unique and it is one of the one percent now i probably still get a hundred or pictures a month sent oh, all claiming to be in that one percent category because it's got a trail or it's hexagonal or it's got a face or it... when when the first orb experiment results were were published um i actually I remember a message coming in saying that's really cool um Thank you for all the hard work. Um, if you look at the orb in photo number 23, um, I can see a face in it. What's your thoughts? You can never convince people. Uh, recently, I was in America, um, and I was working with Jeff Belanger, uh, mm-hmm. who's one of the, the crew of Ghost Adventures, and he brought along the actual Ghost Adventures SLS camera. Ah. The, uh, so we were we were using this camera, mm-hmm. uh, the actual one that Zach and Aaron use on the show. Mm-hmm. 
and we were I quite quickly uh, with a group of members of the public showing them how the camera is able to create these stick figures because uh, explaining how it's programmed and what it's looking for it's looking for uh, a basic human shape which is a vertical uh, a pair of horizontals which represent the arms mm -hmm. and a terminator at the top of the head uh, what top of the, the vertical word head would be now if you use the corner um, of a door frame it's got all those elements. You've got the vertical surface of the, the actual uh, door, and then you've got the horizontal elements of the door frame and the corner of the room. <clears throat> and it's it's a repeatable thing that you can do with an SLS if anybody's got one out there and wants to go and try it. Start pointing it into corners and near doors, and you will... It takes a little bit of uh, fiddling around, you know, a quarter of a degree here and half an inch up there. But once you find out where the ghost is hiding, you can repeatedly keep going back to it over and over and over because the camera has found what it's looking for, it's, what its software is programmed to look for, and then we'll then draw a stick figure on. Um, and if you joggle the camera, you can make the stick figure dance. And we were doing this. Mm. We were getting members of the, the public to come along and make the ghost dance on the chair uh, that we conveniently placed in, in the... Um, the corner mm. and one lady came up afterwards and she said oh um so that's what happens on the show but look i've got a ghost on mine <laughs> and when zach does it there's no door i said it doesn't have to be a door it's just looking for a vertical and a horizontal it can make it out of lots of things uh, but yeah she understood that the camera could be tricked but that zach would never trick anybody of course he would not come on now Everyone's got a demon, remember? All right. Then. <laughs> well. So, with the SLS camera, do you think it's a useless piece of kit? Um, there's a long answer and a short answer, and both of them start with yes. Completely okay. useless piece of kit. It looks cool. Yeah. Looks cool, and that's what that's what television wants. Television is not about Zach most haunted. Any of these shows are not about um, hunting for demons or investigating haunted houses. or They are only about selling advertising. Um, and in order to sell advertising revenue, then you need to have viewers. And in order to have viewers, you've got to have exciting stuff happen. When the very early shows like Ghost Hunters and Most Haunted came out, they just wandered around empty, dark buildings and screamed occasionally, and that got people hooked. But then that got boring. And in order to keep the viewers, you have to up the game. So they started burying people in boxes. They started putting people into extreme situations. Then they, then the ghosts themselves. I remember when Derek went from, you know, the the white lady gliding effortlessly and silently down the corridor. You know, that was passe. So then it became he's a bad navy um, to you know, murderers and cohorts, and then finally Creed Kaffer. Uh, <laughs> It's done Derek's no career any harm at all. It hasn't. Um, <laughs> nor did Rick Edels. Oh, because people <laughs> believe. Um, I, you know, and if, they, if people believe that most haunted, if people believe that ghost hunters or ghost adventures or paranormal lockdown are anything other than soap operas, then that's fine. You know, these are the people that write to the Sun News paper and complain that Deirdre wasn't let out of prison or that Dirty Den you know was was really a nice man it's just misunderstood. They, they take <laughs> they take they take these things out of context mm. they're just television shows to sell advertising revenue for the network and yeah I mean the investigators love it uh, if they get their five minutes of fame on the show everybody likes their five minutes of fame I mean, we live in a celebrity driven society now where that fight, you know, people will sell their own grandmother for five minutes of primetime television. Mm -hmm. um, well, okay, so let's move on. Because I, oh, I'm going to have Anybody to want back. to buy a grandmother, by the way? <laughs> I think Karen's trying to sell hers, to be fair. Now, you've done an article recently where you were interviewed. It wasn't you who wrote the article, but you were interviewed. And you talked about smartphones and the iPhone mm. 6, didn't you? 
Now, I found that really fascinating because, again, the theory in the field generally is that you shouldn't have cameras, um, your your phones, sorry, with you at all. But there are some interesting tech bits, tech term there, everybody, um, within the iPhone series that that you find very useful on investigations, isn't there? Oh, incredibly useful. Uh, in fact, I did a talk for ASAP, uh, was it the conference in 2017, um, all about smartphone, the use of a smartphone. Um, and that, it, that interview was actually based on that earlier. So that's why it was a t- uh, an iPhone 6, which is still probably one of the most common uh, in use at the moment. But people, people put smartphones down as uh, simply toys and simply devices for ghost apps or sticking a ghost for a ghost into your favorite picture of a wall or, or whatever uh, but in reality it's a really powerful device that you can i mean it's got a range of sensors built in it's got the camera and the microphones obviously but it's got a very credible and very uh, sensitive magnetometer it's got accelerometers it's got light meters it, it it's a, a, a sense, you know, standalone sensor packet. It's so good, in fact, um, that when the United States Geological Survey were looking for a uh, new in-field seismometer that they could just take out, drop in into the field um, to monitor earthquake zones or seismic uh, zones of activity, perhaps around volcanoes, they turned to the iPhones. Uh, it was iPhone fours and uh, iPhone fives that they were using initially because the thing could just be left to its own devices plugged into a power supply and then it would it would happily uh, you know send the send the results through the, the cellular phone network and the the data it was able to collect uh, was accurate enough for the USG geological survey all that they did was they, they designed a, uh, a mount that held the the, fam- the phone much more rigidly than, than you know we perhaps would just by resting it on a table but you know i mean there's lots of investigators now who are using the thermal imaging um attachment that you can get from FLIR, and other thermal imaging attachments are available <laughs> but they're they're actually just as capable as the uh, thermal imaging cameras uh, more capable, in fact, than some of the thermal imaging cameras that are four or five times the price. You can buy very sensitive thermometers. You can buy very sensitive uh, audio um, transducers, microphones that can plug into these devices. There's biometric and biomedical and biophysical, uh, f- geophysical uh, sensors that can be plugged into iPhones. You've got a very, very powerful computer, and I'm surprised that ghost hunters haven't cottoned on to this um, other than using them for ghost apps and ghost radars and these sort of uh, off-the-shelf nonsensical apps instead of realizing that that small device that they carry around with them. Uh, in my, in, in, uh, For me personally, when I used to do uh, some of the acoustic measurements, it used to require at least one flight case sized box of stuff, microphones, cables, boxes, and a laptop computer. Uh, but now recently, uh, with, with the addition of a simple plug-in microphone unit, my iPhone will easily give me that the information I require. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's much more portable. It's much more likely to be with me as well. The problem we've got, though, it, again... Everything is is a double-edged sword. Uh, if you look back 20, 30, 40 years ago, when ghost photography was rare, and wasn't in the sun or the mirror every other day with a red circle around it, um, some of the pictures, were like the Brown Lady of Raynham, Tulip Staircase, um, were actually intriguing photographs. But with modern uh, smartphone camera technology, it is actually possible to add an, a ghost to a picture of a room in real time. And so the credibility of photography has decreased immeasurably. The, the, when, when people uh, look at these pictures now, they don't. if the picture is slightly challenging, the first thing they will say is it's an app or it's Photoshop. Because it, that's that's the situation we're in that photography has lost credibility because of technology technological advancement 
we can't rely on photography like we could 50 years ago or, or, or when we were still in the era of analog photography, film photography, where you had that two-stage two process with the negative as a, as a fallback. See, when we get into the tech realms, it gets a bit above my head, to be honest with you. And I'm not, uh, I'm notoriously, like I call the SLS camera the stick man thingy. And um, <laughs> like there's a That's news. probably a good name for it. <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. And then uh, <laughs> like the, there's a new um, posh selfie stick. And I call it the posh selfie stick because it um, takes out, I don't know, lots of movements and stuff like that. So I have to dumb... Basically, what I'm saying is, for my level, I have to kind of dumb it down from my understanding. So when you're talking about things like this, I wouldn't even have a clue where to start with my smartphone in the field. So do you think education... May I recommend this... Ghostology? Oh, well, there we go. We need to buy that book, everybody, it's, and have that in our it's tech co- box. It, it's covered uh, in that, and it does look in detail, and hopefully in a language that makes it really understandable, because when I was writing Ghostology... I was I was I wanted to make it uh, accessible for everybody. So from the people who didn't have the technical knowledge and didn't really have the interest in the, in acquiring the technical knowledge, you know, they wanted to do their type of investigations mm-hmm. uh, through to the you know the the seasoned veteran. Uh, so I pitched the language at a level that I hope is accessible for everybody, and the feedback tends to support that. So. There is actually a section, I think, on go- on smartphones in Ghostology. Brilliant. I was actually recommended that by the lovely Kev Kerr ah, there we to are. read that. Now, one other area that you um, are very, very knowledgeable about is you focused your research a lot on sound and acoustics, didn't you? Mm-hmm. That's right. Oh, and particularly in- acoustics that you can't hear. It, which is infrasound, right? Uh, it, it, yes, broadly, but it's gone beyond that now. Oh, right. OK. So, <laughs> so infrasound, um, again, in the field has been um, rather than people going, oh, it's EMF. They're talking about, oh, it's more likely to be something that's caused through an infrasound that goes on in the location that's triggering something mm-hmm. physiologically, which makes you think that you're experiencing something which you're possibly not because it's mm-hmm. the... The, the sound acoustics that are causing that within your body rather than you actually having a ghost walk across the room or something like that. But infrasound is something... I mean, we used to think that about EMF having that effect on the body, didn't we? And now we've gone into infrasound. Uh, infrasound has always been the poor relation of EMF because, like EMF, you can't see it, you can't hear it, you can't smell it or taste it, you've got no real way of knowing it's there um, and it's an easy thing to point a finger at if you're a sceptic and go ah, well look at that, there's infrasound there that's, that's the obvious explanation the reality is that uh, infrasound, yes, absolutely uh, causes these effects in some people sometimes, and that's the important thing that you've got to remember it is not the universal panacea um, the presence of infrasound will not universally cause people to uh, believe that they are having a paranormal experience. It may, in some instances, cause some people to have a uh, an increased experience, which they will attribute to uh, the paranormal. But there have to be other conditions present. Um, because we, we have infrasound where you are now, where I am now, uh, we have infrasound around us all of the time. We, you know, it's it's part of our daily lives. Uh, it's omnipresent all of the time. So you think, well, if that was the case, then we'd always be jumping out of our skin and seeing ghosts everywhere. Uh, if you if you take somebody to a location um, where other senses are triggered, so for example, someone that's traditionally a bit spooky or they're on their own, isolated. You tell them it's a haunted building. You 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 change the situation a little bit. Then get them to uh, you know if they then focus on these unusual sensations, then it's not really surprising that they start to report an increased number of paranormal experiences. Mm-hmm. Uh, but on its own. Uh, occasionally some of the time uh, it will it will randomly trigger these experiences uh, in some people 
it works out around about um, after we've done all of the experiments and crunched the numbers around about one third of the population are susceptible to infrasound and this can be seen in, in people who object to the hum and hear these these uh, supernatural or paranormal hums that are so often reported in the papers mm-hmm. and have been for, for decades um, and some people living next door, next door but one up the street even in the same house go, I can't hear a thing it's not affecting me at all uh, Infrasound has that ability to affect some people and around about one third of, of, of a population would broadly be more susceptible but then you have to add other factors in um, as well um, in order for the paranormal to be you know, blamed or it to be attributed to a paranormal cause by the person. But what, what's, what's most interesting is that that research has moved on a pace um, away from just infrasound to focus on all sound, but sound that, that we just don't hear because the overall amplitude, the volume of it is below um, that uh, which our ears are sort of receiving. I mean, our ears are hearing it and the brain's just nulling it out. Um, but that, that, that sort of effect, this subliminal effect of sounds that we're not consciously hearing uh, affects the entire sound spectrum. And you can you can see that sometimes uh, um, in some paranormal cases where people uh, interestingly start to report feeling like they've got a song in their head or they're hearing tunes. Uh, and in actual fact, what you if you look at the sort of the sound spectrum below the audible range, so where the volume is b- below that the uh, that that the brain is responding to. You, you will find a range of sounds and tones sometimes that are suggestive of music. Yeah, we get that quite a lot when you're like completely dead silent, you think you can hear music. It's mm-hmm. a form of audio pareidolia we've classed it as, isn't it? It has a name, I can't remember it. Uh, well, Musical it, ear syndrome, that's the one. Well, it, you are actually hearing sound, but it's sound that normally you would never, you would never hear. Your body, re, your, you know, your, your ears do respond to it, your brain responds to it as, as it does with infrasound. But your brain is nulling it out um, normally. But in, in some situations, your brain starts to try and make sense of it and starts to impose voices or musicality or tunes uh, into this, this uh, inaudible sound or normally inaudible sound. It's really quite strange to talk about sound that you can't hear because people uh, think that because you can't hear it, you're not aware of it. Uh, hearing is is a two stage process. First of all, the ears respond, and then they send a signal to the brain, which also has to respond. Now, the ears are capable of responding at very, very low and very high frequencies. You know, we our ears are you, you probably give Fido a run for its money um, in terms of hearing, but our brain is the the final arbiter of what we can hear, uh, and we don't always and we don't hear with just our ears, and you. This is an effect you can see in any public house on a Friday or Saturday night. You can sit in a very noisy public house across the table from your friends and have a perfectly good conversation with them. Yet if you put a, a sound recorder on the table between you, you won't, it won't record the conversation uh, over the background noise and the din and the clatter of the, the pub. Because what you're doing is your brain is using both... Uh, your ears, the sounds it's hearing, and your eyes in terms of partial lip reading and body language reading to make the to make you hear, in inverted commas, the conversation. Mm-hmm. So, so hearing is actually a, a very visual thing as much as it is an actual sound wave. It uses, you know, it, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it doesn't just use, you know, it uses a lot of our processing uh, powers and other, you know, not just vision. Vision is very important to hearing. Um, but it also uses uh, context, con- uh, contextual processing. So we we know how language is is you know it's something we learn intrinsically when we're very small children. We know how sentences are constructed and which words are likely to f- follow other words. Um, and this is why we we can, we will always be better than an or, uh, you know an auto spell checker or a grammar checker. 
Well, it's absolutely fascinating, the sound, but I do want to talk to you about this new book that you've written. Oh, good. Uh, <laughs> because we're running out of time, so when we're going to, like, we'll cut that conversation, we'll go on to the guidance notes. <laughs> now, you've written the guidance notes for investigations of spontaneous cases. I have. Is it basically a tick list of what you should do to create a great paranormal investigation? Uh, no, that's too... That... Is that too simplified? Yeah, because every group has got to find their own best way. Um, what works for parascience will not necessarily work for any other group because groups are made of individuals and have their own dynamic. What what the guidance notes are are a series of, of steps of good practice that you should try and get as close to as possible because if you can, then your evidence will be more credible and you will be able to present your case in a better way, in a more satisfactory way to your peers and to the clients. So it's a series of steps for uh, getting the very, maximizing your opportunity uh, um, of, produ- of obtaining good quality information from everything you investigate. Would this cover every type of investigation excepting public investigations? It would even cover some public investigations. And, and broadly, it, because there isn't really that much difference between investigating a UFO case or a Loch Ness monster case than a ghost case, um, it would even, you know, it could be extended into other areas of investigation also. But, but broadly, uh, it is aimed at those who are investigating cases that involve apparitions, poltergeists, haunted hauntings, and similar phenomena. That's where the main focus of the guide is. Okay, so if you use that alongside your ghostology book, Uh you've got a pretty comprehensive understanding of investigating and what you're looking for and the tech you use with it. Uh, Yes, uh, you would. This would be the bit that was missing out of ghostology, I suppose. Okay. So when we talk about the field, there's been talk before about bringing it under some form of um, governing body. Uh huh. These two books that you've written are pretty good start to bringing everybody in line with everybody else if they used all the the tips and, and knowledge that's within these books, right? Uh, yeah, but I would be and have been vociferously against attempts to regulate because it's it's never going to work. ASAP have tried it. Yeah. Uh, and there have been others, Parry Unity, and you know, hey, we're all in this together. Uh, we're not. Uh, um, it won't Quite work, simply, and, and the reason, we're not. <laughs> yeah, we're not. That is that we're all looking for the same thing. Uh, we're no, we're not. Um, <laughs> it's because you can't regulate such, you know, and it, it would be wrong to regulate uh, you know, such a diverse area of study uh, with with a broad brush set of rules of you can and you can't. ASAP have tried. With, the national registration schemes in the past they set themselves up i think it's about 2011 um, as the government recognized official body representing paranormal investigators well so what nobody cared it didn't change anything and it was never going to because people as in that response before to the guidance notes you know just because you've been doing it 135 years doesn't mean you can tell me how to do it if we are going to change something yes we do as ghost investigators need to up our game and produce quality evidence to challenge those who would criticize and be skeptical of the phenomena and of people's experiences but what we did the people we need to educate most are the people into whose houses and properties ghost investigators regularly get called and you know only this past week gone there was that dreadful case of the Scottish demonologist who turned out to be a paedophile. Mm. What the question isn't, you know, who you're going to call. It should really be one of who are you going to let into your house? And that's where any regulation will come, not from the ghost investigators trying to regulate themselves. That is an impossible task for, uh, and will never be achievable. But if organizations try to educate the public as to what to expect from a good quality investigator and a good quality investigation and 
to reject those who are clearly turning up with, you know, things I've seen down the years, inverted crosses stuck in the front lawn um, uh, and all manner of other strange practices and bizarre practices. Yeah, that, that's where the field, you know, that regulation has to come from those whom we are servicing the client. Educate them to ask the right questions before they let people into their houses or properties. The the idea that a newspaper or a radio show or a television show calls somebody an expert is no basis for allowing that person into your house unless you've done so. I mean, would you let the bloke across the street rewire your, you know your entire house electrics just because the lady? One door further up said, oh, you know him, he's an expert. Well, you wouldn't, would you? I mean, it's, it's dangerous and silly, and yet people let these expert ghost investigators into their property all the time. Um, you know, sprinkling salt and... Yeah, salt. Sorry, I was just reminded of something the other day. I was reading the other day about somebody who'd done a, a house clearance using... They'd sprinkled salt literally everywhere. Because it was very good for slugs. And they got rid of the slugs. Well, they got rid of the slugs. <laughs> <laughs> nice house is all I'm thinking at that point, if they've got slugs inside the house. Well, yeah. Uh, so, the old folks, too. Most of them could do with a good dusting and hoovering. Anyway. <laughs> so these guidance notes, guidance notes mm-hmm. I'm noticing that there are a few people in the field that have been purchasing these, but they all seem to be people that are always wanting to educate themselves further. They're not seeming to be the outreach to the other people this is in the field the and that's frustrating the, isn't it it's incredibly frustrating and the conundrum is uh, with the guidance notes i spent a very long time writing them um, after the commission was given by the spr because it i didn't want it to be read by members of the spr or members of asap or or indeed members of quite a few paranormal groups i wanted the people i wanted the everyday investigator the people who who said that they've got nothing to learn it was written for them uh, because they're the people who i believe would benefit the most and it, it's not criticizing what they're doing it's not telling them that they're doing something wrong it's simply saying well take what you're doing and up it up, up you know take it up take it up to the next level tighten up a few things change a few things and your, you will find that your, you know, your evidence will be more credible and will be received better. You're, you know, forget about just trying to produce class A EVPs for Facebook. Go after the real evidence because it's it's there and it needs getting. Um, so yeah, it's trying to crack that readership, the the broad you sort of, and it, it's it's not critical of these people, but they seem to think that you know you, if you try and say hey, have a look at this, you might find it helpful, that in some way you're criticising them. And that's not the intention, and that's not the style of the guidance notes anyway. No, in fact, only, only in three or four sections where it deals with the ethics are the words must ever used. And that only relates to some vulnerable classes of, of uh, client that people would encounter. The rest of the time, it's just a guide. And it is, it's called guidance notes. It's not a set of you must follow instructions. Yeah. Where can they find this book? Where can they Current, book? Currently, uh, if they go to uh, spr.ac.uk, um, which is the Society for Psychical Research website, there's a, book, um, there's a books for sale tab. Um, on there that's the place you can get it from currently it will be on amazon before the end of november um so at the moment it's only from the spr which is triple wspr.ac.uk uh, but it will be on amazon within within yes yeah, so the next four to six weeks well i've just shared that link into the chat room um, <laughs> I'm being told not to let you go, that I've got to keep talking to you. <laughs> I just think that's an excuse to have you back on at a later date. <laughs> um, I've shared the link. It's where you can fi- uh, buy the book into the chat room. There's also a great blog that's been done um, as a review on the guidance notes that's done been done by Ashley. I believe he shared the link mm-hmm. on his blog as well. So if you want to go over and have a little bit more of a deeper look at what, what it's about, then go over just there. Just please, 
Yeah. The one thing I want people to take away is this is not a criticism. This is not a you must do it this way finger wagging thing from the SPR. This is you know, using the 135 years, 136 years, and giving you, giving everybody something you know, to say, look, just try this. Give it a go. I agree. No, I is. totally agree. And and when we talk about bringing the field together, it's it's tools like this that will allow the field to be brought together. So the SPR are putting stuff out like that, but the ghost hunting community needs to take that and work with mm-hmm. it, you know, and, and learn from it. Like you say, you've, they've got um, 135 years of experience there. Why it's can't a fantastic we resource it for people. Very much so. Trust me, I've been into the library and, oh my goodness, <laughs> I nearly had a meltdown. And that wasn't, that wasn't the archives, which is a whole different ballgame. No, that was no, just no. the library. That's just the library. <laughs> that is one, that's just very, very small part of I mean, And people can use the library. You don't have to go to London. You can actually access books from the library if you're a member of the SPR. Mm-hmm. They exactly. will post them to you. And if you are in London, you don't even have to be a member of the SPR. You just pay a nominal fee and they'll let you use their library. Yep. So these resources are out there. So, guys, it really is a resource that you can use to up your game in the paranormal field. And then we can start working together with the academics and getting that data research and pushing the field forward as a collective rather than everybody going off and doing their individual thing. Yeah. Let's make life uncomfortable for academics and skeptics by, <laughs> uh, by, by presenting them with evidence that will that'll rattle them. That's, That's what we need. Yeah. And it's, it, it's there. It's there for the taking. There are areas within psychical research and uh, ghost investigation where you know good quality uh, results can be and are being obtained and can um, you know can rattle these academics in their ivory towers, make their life uncomfortable. Hashtag life goal. I think that should be. Hashtag make a parapsychologist uncomfortable today. <laughs> So, guys, I've shared all the links for all of the books that um, Mr. Parsons has written and been involved in into the chat room and the SPR as well. It's definitely something to be looking um, looking at and into and using that resource. We have actually come to the end of the show, guys. I know that they're all in the chat room going, no, I'm oh, going. It. <laughs> but would you come back and talk to me further? Because there's so many areas that we've not even touched on that I'd like yes, to talk to you about. Absolutely. Your latest research is about time slips, isn't it? Uh, no, that's very old research, but it oh, keeps is it, old? <laughs> it keeps it keeps co- well. It might be a time slip. It keeps coming round and round and round. And we've just been filming. Well, earlier this year we were filming for in search of relating to time slips. It's something that never go, quite goes away, or it might never have actually got here. Yeah, it's one of those, isn't it? I'd love to talk to you about. <laughs> and as I said, I'd love to talk to you further on a different show if that's okay with you. Cool. Yep. Cool. Thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. Don't forget, guys, Parasearch Radio has shows going out several nights of the week. We are available on YouTube. We are over on Twitter. We are on Podbean. We're on SoundCloud. Oh, we're all over Facebook. Oh, my goodness. If you don't know Parasearch Radio, then I suggest you check out some of the past shows we've done. We have great guests on and we talk about some great topics. On that note, I'd like to say thank you once again, Mr. Parsons. I like to call you Mr. Parsons rather than Steve. Is that right? I know, Steve. Steve. (laughs) And if you've Uh, missed, and and, and if if you're worrying about ice road truckers, apparently it's on the plus, uh, whatever it is, on Tuesday night on the catch up. (laughs) And on that note, we bid you a very farewell. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening. Good night. Don't forget to join us for more shows throughout the week. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web to keep up to date with all the shows right here on Parasearch Radio.